an author. He is a former speechwriter for President Trump, and he is the uh, gray eminence behind Revolver News. Welcome, Darren. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for, for coming on. Um, you're also one of the, the most incisive analysts of our current moment, uh, both in terms of U.S. policy and also the reverberations that U.S. policy has around the world, uh, including in far off distant, uh, you know, backwaters like Romania from, from where I'm currently speaking. Uh, oh, wow. So it's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. Where the, in Romania are you? I'm in Transylvania. That's that's where I'm from. Okay. And I've then, been there. I've been to Brasov. Oh. I've been to Arad. I've spent a lot of time in Romania. Oh, so. really? That's excellent. Yeah, that's, that's very close to where I'm now. I'm... I'm quite. Uh, I'm on the border to Hungary, so not like in in the depth of Transylvania. Almost, almost <laughs> Hungary, definitely a city that would be claimed by by Austria Hungary if they, if they still could. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Well, I I do love Brasov. Yeah, it, it is it is one of the one of the better ones. Um, I'm. I wanted to to chat to you about uh, you know your your coining of the the globalist American empire. And and why you think it uh, might not be a, a complete force for good, um, you know? What is a globalist American empire, and, and what a what a, what are the the dark connotations? Why why is it a corrupting force? Mm, well, yes, this is a new coinage, and as coinages go, it's done pretty well. It's taken off and kind of acquired its own mimetic life beyond its originator, which is you know, is a mark of success with these things. And so I think I have to respect its own organic development and simply acknowledge a lot of the strength of a term like globalist American empire in part comes from its ambiguity and its flexibility with respect to different use cases and connotations. But I think it does kind of capture something that we all kind of feel and notice and that is that um, the American state, but beyond just the state, the American kind of institutional apparatus, America as an institution, as a state, as a projective force upon the world um, has always had kind of a checkered history, but now it's questionable and even ridiculous in some, in some ways. And so, you know, the kind of the initial throb of inspiration for this idea came from an observation that, you know, if you see a rainbow flag anywhere in the world, um, even more so than the American flag, the rainbow flag indicates that American power is not too far away. It's a sign of American power. And so this merger of the toxic political ideology that we all experience in America domestically, the emerger with that, with the way that America projects and um, arrogates power overseas, I think is a very kind of interesting um, development that's very acutely uh, uh, felt right now. And it's sort of, there's this old formulation, um, invade the world, invite the world. And this has a kind of similar structure in the sense that it identifies a kind of comprehensive logic, uh, a coherent logic with the way that the American state and its institutional apparatus um, uh, commands power domestically through propaganda narratives and how they command power um, abroad. And so the sort of comprehensive term for this, for the force of this is the globalist American empire, which of course also has uh, a convenient and amusing um, acronym. <laughs> um, it, it does seem like um, the, the, the old neocon uh, idea of, you know, transporting freedom abroad has kind of shifted into a, a deeply neoliberal version of essentially the same thing, which is transporting, you know, this, this new virulent religion abroad. And it might, it seems like it's even more powerful, like it, it, it's even more justified because even, even back in the day with the neocon, people had all sorts of ideas that, okay, this 
States, these are wars for oil, you know, all sorts mm -hmm. of ideas about, you know, this, this is kind of like a kleptocracy. But now it seems like this has been laundered very efficiently. Like we have Black Lives Matter marches out, outside, of, you know, of my house, almost in Romania. Right. Uh, this is this this uh, ideology is is has permeated and it seems to be very hard to fight. Like this is this is the new frame. Um, it's, I don't necessarily see how someone takes, you know, steps steps out of it or you know is allowed to step out of it. Right. Well, it's fought in the narrative uh, on the on the level of narratives and ideology and propaganda and psychological warfare. And I, I think, um, you know, this is connected to a lot of important things that are not just developments, but have kind of been in the works for a while. And that is that, you know, the, the real American superpower is not any kind of, you know, special um, weapon or special kind of, you know, product of advanced scientific engineering the real American weapon and the real comparative advantage behind American power is its mastery, uh, full spectrum mastery of propaganda and all of the preconditions for effective distribution of propaganda. That's our superpower. And we've had to lean onto that comparative advantage more and more so in the foreign policy arena, um, partly because of the complete and manifest failure of Iraq, which was the last like real robust sort of boots on the ground operation. Now, domestically in the United States, there's so little appetite or tolerance for something like that, that we, real, we have to put all of our cards in this regime change model that had already been in the works. They're called the color revolution model, which I and revolver.news has done pretty effective work in kind of mainstreaming this concept, particularly on the American right. But this idea of the color revolution, which is facilitated really by command of propaganda, by control of various um, non-governmental organizations that can be activated in conjunction with uh, American and Western friendly media in order to have, you know, massive protests. And it's just another regime change model that leans on this um, command of ideology and psychological warfare that I think is very much an American thing and very central to the nature of, uh, uh, of power of, of the globalist American empire. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, you've spoken about color revolutions. What what uh, distinguishes? Um, uh, how how would we know that we're in the midst of a of a color revolution? What are what are the the markers of, of this phenomenon? Right. Well, again, it's it's not fully a precise um, term. Like it it does. It's like it's rooted in a history of specific types of. Um, of revolutions in Eastern Europe, like the color revolution, the orange revolution and, and things like this in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, but really the, the two chief, and I would say defining characteristics of the color revolution, one is massive mobilized protests. And these protests are usually done by activating youth groups and student groups in conjunction with NGOs and really relies on, again, these, you know, uh, pet ideologies of, you know, feminism and, you know, you know, you have a bunch of women marching, you see that in Belarus recently, that is a typical marker. A lot of times they will activate um, minority grievances as, as well. And you see that like even now in Myanmar with the Rohingya or in, in China with the Uyghurs, it's, you know, it's very convenient to activate some kind of minority grievance and have the NGOs really, um, you know, kind of pump that up and use that to gin up mass protests and international support. So mass protests is one thing and also kind of various soft approaches to delegitimizing whatever leader, target leader they don't like, the quote unquote authoritarian. And you saw a lot of these methods really direct against Trump. And that was sort of the central observation of this revolver.news series was saying, look, the very same tactics, the color revolution tactics, this network of color revolution regime change operatives 
would use professionally in Eastern Europe, they're running that same playbook here in the United States. And in fact, it's not just a method, it's a particular network of people with particular interests. Uh, principally, their concern is Europe, their concern is with Russia and Russia's energy dominates in Europe. And that's, you know, kind of that story can, can go on. But um, basically, it's a network of people. One of the key figures involved that Revolver.News exposed, Norm Eisen, literally wrote a book on how to do uh, color revolutions. And he was one of the chief operatives domestically in the United States. And so um, the other characteristics, other than just sort of mass mobilization triggered by NGOs and friendly uh, media is some kind of claim on the legitimacy of the ruler that is sort of a soft claim, either um, a contested election kind of claim, or there is something going on with the election or um, things like this. Um, and then, of course, part of the playbook is you have these mass protests, you kind of try to trigger whatever regime you're targeting to clamp down on those protests. And that clamp down can then feed into the propaganda machine and reinforce the original narratives that here's an authoritarian, he uh, needs to be removed and so forth. So that's kind of generally what, what a color, color revolution looks like. Um, but I wouldn't get too stuck with precise definitions. Yeah, it's it's interesting to me that this format wouldn't really work without the U.S. Um, kind of media empire and propaganda empire right. first right. doing the legwork for 10, 20, 30 years right. and seeding the ground and, and kind of framing the narrative because you couldn't have you couldn't have, um, you know, you wouldn't have any leverage in these countries if mm -hmm. you wouldn't have set the narrative up. You know, since 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 like in Romania, it was Dallas. That's how it started. Everyone watched Dallas, and we really loved Dallas, and that was essentially the the, the main propaganda arm of the American Empire, uh, and it was really good, and it helped obviously to to crumble the the uh, the Soviet Union, uh, and you know kick us into high gear because we we wanted the appliances and you know the the high you know, high shine lifestyle that we saw there, you know, definitely better right. than, than what was here. Uh, and I definitely see the, the positives in that. But then since since then, since that, you know, what was it like 30 years ago? Um, you know, we've we've been uh, we've got a, a few more memes from from that direction. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that essentially uh, our adherence to the European Union and the West and and this whole meme plex that comes essentially through through the US, uh, you know, I could see how you could have a color revolution in Romania, but you know, it's uh, it it wouldn't be possible without without you know. Right. Yeah. But do they even need one? Like I, I'm I haven't followed. The last time I was in Romania, I think Ponta was in charge. Um, yeah, I think Ponta before that was Bosescu. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't and, think. And, but but my my impression is that you know in order for that to even be necessary you need someone who's screwing up with the business plan so again i haven't done a deep dive into romania for a while but my my impression is that basically the energy sector has been uh shoveled up by western companies anyway yeah, I don't think there's there's any energy for any sort of populism uh, in in Romania yeah. or anything. Maybe maybe populism is is too, too broad a term, but any sort of thing that would be in the interest of the population rather than in the interest sure. of of the of the oligarchy. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't think that this is not a, Romania is not a target for <laughs> for color revolution anytime soon. It's just not interesting enough. Um, it it was interesting to me. Um, I, I I heard you say this on a on a previous podcast with someone else, but it was uh, the idea that you know just from from um, a game theoretical perspective, you are looking at a a highly you know um, morally imperialistic religious movement with with the thing that we now call wokeism or you know mm -hmm. this uh, this move, and then um, what what you can put in opposition to that is. Um, I don't know, <laughs> GOP politics or, you know, li socially liberal, fiscally conservative or whatever people want to call it. And that 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 is always a losing strategy because, you know, don't tread on me will always be annihilated by moral imperialism because it's it's it has fervor, it has energy and it has claims that are active against the other party 
well, don't tread on me is just leave me alone, which is, you know, it's not, it's not just passive. It's, it's almost an invitation to encroach. So um, right. I thought that was really interesting. And I mean, could you, could you develop that a little bit? Cause I, I thought that was, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's just kind of, you know, looking at sort of gaming out political outcomes from the perspective of a kind of comparative moral psychology and the moral psychology that animates the left or you know it doesn't ha even have to be called the left but whatever it's called the the real kind of woke fanatics adherence to this new toxic ideology of the globalist american empire um it does benefit from a genuine enthusiastic and even fanatical kind of moral imperialism and by moral imperialism it's not to say that it's moral in an objective sense, but it's moral in the kind of psychological sense of, you know, it's experienced as an issue of right or wrong. And it's imperialist in the sense that it has to impose its moral view on others. And so the juxtaposition, which, which you mentioned, and kind of I riffed on this in another podcast a while ago, is the kind of the um, don't tread on me, which is favored by the American conservatives and libertarians, which is just, you know, um, just leave me alone. If, if you step on me, I'll get you, but just leave me alone. Keep, this is my space here and don't come in these doors because I'm a two-way guy. I'm a, I'm a two-way guy. I've got, I've got guns, so just don't come in these doors, right? Which is a kind of cope in my view. And the alternative to that, which is, you know, animating the left that we saw with the protests over the last summer is silence is violence. And silence is violence means that um, if someone's sitting over there or someone lives over there, it's not enough for them to be quiet. If they're not raising their fist and shouting Black Lives Matter with me, they are committing violence and therefore they must either change or be enemies with us or against us. So it's, and it's an imperialist expansionist type position. And my observation was simply that this moral imperialism, when it comes into conflict with a kind of um, don't tread on me, just leave me alone um, kind of attitude, um, it will win. And it's not a matter of, you know, which one is superior from a moral position. It's simply observing which position wins when the two come into conflict politically. And it's hard to deny that uh, silence is violence will always beat, don't tread on me. And so I think in order for the right to be successful, they need um, a kind of moral voltage of their own and an old and and I think that can be tested by you know how convincingly can you say shame on you shame on you you know when you say shame on you and you say it convincingly you say it to a dog the dog feels it the dog feels the shame and that's how I approach journalists I say shame on you because they are dogs and I don't know if they're capable of feeling shame, but um, I should feel a certain way when I say that. And I think everyone else should too, is that these people, they're not just, you know, children who are um, immaturely taking to an extreme uh, position, which in its proper parameters would be moral. No, they're not just irresponsible children. They are evil and ugly and immoral and they should be ashamed of themselves and their and their ancestors so that's the kind of position that i think really needs to be internalized in order to get anywhere because it just the just leave me alone thing doesn't yeah. work but it it seems like this moral framework is really it really has been internalized by both sides 
um and you know they, they kind of take it as a given i think that's probably the, the the weak point for for any sort of conservative politics they kind of start from the starting point of you know this these are all good intentions but oh we can't go that far well that's already a losing position uh no they're they're not good intentions uh, they're based on 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 very flimsy flimsy logic and very flimsy data and very flimsy everything um, right or or they just they simply like have internalized the moral framework of their enemy and they spend most of their time trying to prove that they're not whatever kind of inverted moral terminology the left uses to control them they're not racist they're not sexist they're not this or conversely that actually the left is you know is the you know they're the real racist they're the real sexist it never works it only reinforces um the weapons that the left owns and controls and uses to subjugate their political opposition, which is the right, and basically anyone who opposes ridiculous regime of, again, the globalist American empire. That's one thing I did find charming about Romania is I did not encounter anyone who went to pains to prove to me that they weren't racist. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely not a, not as much of a talking point here than, than you think, uh, but it's becoming one. You'd be surprised. Yeah, people people my age and younger, especially well educated, Western educated, are very mm -hmm. very concerned about racism, um, and especially about 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 black people, which is very interesting because we have maybe you can count them on on, on one hand, so like the mm -hmm. black population is very very small. But yeah, it's uh, it's very important for us to to think about it. Um, there is. Um, you know, there's all sorts of speculation about what what is the seed, where where does this you know this new religion come from? Uh, you know, some people say it's it's postmodernism. It's you know it's just French people they they've derailed liberalism. Um, some people say it's you know it's it's older than that. Some people say it's you know Christianity. Since Paul, we have been on this path, and this is this is the this is where we've where it's led us. Um, but it it feels to me like um, it's it's in a way it's game theory as well. Because you have these, these, these multicultural societies, which have formed because you know, they have formed slowly in aggregate, um, and then you um, you have you know multiple ethnicities, multiple religions, multiple genders. Then you slap statistics on top of it, and then you observe that you know through six, seven, ten, a hundred iterations, uh, results are, are unequal. In, in these groups, whichever way you slice it, there's going to be unequal results. And sometimes they have some form of, you know, periodicity. Sometimes they, they, they consistently are unequal in the same way. Um, and then you need a, an explanatory framework. But your society has one explanatory framework is that all men are created equal. And once you take out the metaphysics out of that explanation, and you talk about dignity and things like that that are very lofty and you know don't really make much sense in the absence of, of kind of a religious framework around them. Um, it 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 kind of follows that people will turn this into a bit of a secular religion, because outcomes are unequal. They continue to be unequal. There must be something wrong with the system. Something is rotten at the core of the system, uh, because we've enshrined this egalitarian assumption in our system. So to, to me, it feels like this is almost an inevitable endpoint of, of all of these factors coming together. So it's, it's inevitable because it rests on a presupposition of equality? Yeah, I mean, you have, you know, the, it is essentially one of the, one of the basic assumptions that, you know, all men are created equal. And when you have, um, you know, when religion is out of the picture and there's no really any redemption in the, in the afterlife, just everything is about the here and now. And the way we measure the here and now is success, status, money, all of the things that typically tie to, you know, how efficient you are in, in getting the goods in, in this society. And some people are more efficient than others in getting these goods. And there is a certain stratification in how that turns out. Some groups t end up on top, you know, uh, Ashkenazi Jews are doing pretty good. Uh, there's, you know, South Asians in, in Silicon Valley doing pretty good. Women in nuclear physics, not so much. And I don't expect it to change in a hundred years. So mm -hmm. these things will be observed, um, mm -hmm. and they'll they'll create certain waves. And <laughs> we don't really have a, a very good explanatory framework for why there's no not equity across the board if we're all created equal. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, if you if you're 
if you work to this stuff, you, you'll know that you'll expect certain, you know, there's going to be certain differences, but the fact that they're always almost the same, that, that really does kind of, you know, put the onus on the system to prove that it's not racist. It kind of moves the, the burden of proof onto the system. And I can see how that can turn religious really fast. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially when you have economies like these, where you have kind of winner take all effects in almost any industry and extreme inequality deepening. Uh, so, you know, people, people will kind of become sensitive to, to these factors. Plus everything is extremely visible. You know, it's like a hundred years ago, you could ask me like, who's the richest guy in town? I maybe, maybe I wouldn't have known, but now he's, I can see him. I can see a hundred of them and they're very mm. visible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly, that's certainly a factor. Um, what's actually going on with egalitarianism? Um, you know, that is an interesting question. You know, there's the kind of, um, really, again, the moral psychology of it, um, that I think is quite persuasive and um, comes largely from Nietzsche. I, I think that there is a lot to that. Um, this kind of, uh, it's really, you know, from Nietzsche's explanation, it's really, you know, is it really about achieving equal results or is it about finding purpose um, and doing that through a kind of inverted morality? I think this inverted morality is, you know, it is a kind of spiritual dimension. I mean, religion is hard to really define unless you define it in religious terms itself. You have to really kind of define it in psychological terms and in terms of like maybe fanaticism of belief. When does, you know, science become a religion? When does something else become a religion? But the... Um, so I, I think that that's a dimension. Um, but again, I think as you're kind of getting at with the, oh, before you couldn't see this or see that, I think a lot of these attempts to come up with an explanation for, okay, here's, here's kind of philosophically or historically the kind of inflection point that we can use to more or less fully characterize this position that we're in. I think those approaches really do kind of they, they put too much burden on these historical antecedents without understanding what all these different things going on now that can amplify and distort human social life and political life to such a degree that it becomes an issue of uh, is come becomes qualitative rather than merely quantitative, just how profoundly kind of this interconnected digital um, uh, existence can set things out of their proper sphere and therefore kind of drive people crazy on a collective level. And then that craziness is looped back into the system as people's mental illnesses are exploited politically. And even to the point that they come po become political ideologies in their own right, that mental illnesses are kind of transmogrified into political ideologies. And so and how all of this is really like hard to imagine really it playing out like this um, without these kinds of, you know, technological and social preconditions that are really quite new. And so again, um, you know, it's, it's always going to be a mixture of the new and the old, but I think that there there is actually a tendency to want to lean more on the old because it's already there. And especially if you're someone like me who has spent basically my entire twenties like reading, learning, and attempting to master the philosophical tradition, you want to put that to use. And it's not to say that's not helpful, but um I think there's a lot of new thinking that's required to really, you know, understand the newness of this situation, not even as a kind of, you know, political psychology issue or soci sociological issue, but even as an issue of regime type. 
like the globalist American empire, of course, you can point to like what kind of, you know, historical regime types does this look like and how can we, you know, uh, use some kind of historical example to bring insight into our, you know, decline and so forth. But actually, I think it's a special type of decline. It's a special type of regime. And it's a special and new type of situation. And that is maybe one of the few, not redeeming, but few um, uh, positive features of this tragic mess we're in, that it's at least kind of interesting if you can detach yourself enough to try to understand it in those terms, because it is, I think, quite new and um, its perversity is endless. Yes, um, I think I think the, the the main example of of how new it is is how how it scales, and you know you have kind of this religious component, the, you know the, the the moral fervor part, but you have, for example, a video of of police brutality or whatever, an angle that convinces you uh, on on the situation that convinces you that there has been police brutality um and and then you have that added to all sorts of ways to frame it by the media mm -hmm. i mean george floyd obviously is the is the quintessential case here um you know you've you've written about this but there is an even more um current case the the dante wright case um, mm -hmm. And this is this is quite fresh because I've, I've just read a, an article, I think it was written by you about uh, how this is a representation of, uh, of clown world, uh, one of one of the better ones. And I am curious why why you think this is uh, quite quite the, the best example we have right now of, of how uh, the, the globalist American empire is, uh, is turning into clown world. Of which example exactly? I'm, I'm the the Dante right. This is the this is the woman police officer uh, oh. shooting, tasering. <laughs> it's just a combination of everything you know it's it's the the incompetent female cop it's the um non-compliant you know quote unquote victim who tries to evade the police it's the inevitable riots that can't be stopped it's you know it's just everything together um again it's it's this whole system seems to be if not set up, it presents itself as a profound assault on people's mental well-being because it's all so crazy and it's all mixed up simultaneously. Um, and so, um, you know, it's just a very, very yeah. disruptive period, but it's also just has this bizarre and clownish dimension to the um, to the tragic dimension, and and again, I think that's part of the newness of. Yeah, it's. I think it's also, to, to me, the clownish dimension is how predictable the the steps are as well. You know, even even if you just hear like a, an echo of something that might have happened, you're already kind of you can intuit what the framing is going to be, and mm -hmm. and you know who the who the usual suspects will be and how how they're going to position it, and um, you know. Right. Yeah, which which businesses will be boarded up and mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh it's it's quite it's quite interesting. But like you said, this one has uh, quite a few layers of, of clownishness to it. Right. Right. Yeah. It's the you know, the the apparent contradictions of anarcho tyranny. But it's it's not a contradiction if you understand it as as anarcho tyranny. But um yeah that's that's the system of government that we have that's a mechanism of control is this interesting and bizarre and perverse combination of anarchy and chaos and and tyranny um, yeah i think yeah. The, the the media layer is the most interesting because it, it essentially what it's trying to do is put the narrative on top of the anarcho tyranny flipping it completely 180 so that it looks it almost looks like a narco tyranny from the other angle where it's like, okay, this is your complete and other, you know, open season on, on black people on the street, polices, you know, engaging mm -hmm. in, in constant violence. It's all racist. There's never a mistake. It's all completely, uh, you know, voluntary <laughs> and, and, and violent. Um, and it is interesting. I, I mean, for someone, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in, in obviously in a right wing echo chambers and, and all this type of stuff. So obviously my, my lens is warped the other direction, but I really cannot understand how 
what this looks like from from the mainstream from from the middle how can one take a, away the, these lessons i guess it, it's probably just you know editing or there's there's there are techniques to this obviously you know propaganda is is an art uh, and and they've learned how to how to wield this tool but um it it i feel like it, there must be a breaking point where reality has to is, has been cleaved so far from the narrative that um, you know it must you know red pill moments must be abounding everywhere but that's maybe that's just my hope but i don't know feels like it has to happen yeah i don't know i i think with younger people who are saturated in non cable media there's just an inevitable um an intense polarization i think the kind of the center approach you know can mean different things in different contexts but really the centrism in the way I think most people understand it is really more available to older generations who consume different media. They consume primarily cable news media and they consume media with the kind of different software that they bring to the table that kind of um, conditions what they absorb and how they absorb it. And um, I, I think it's very hard for these, you know, a lot of these older people, even people like Biden, I think I'd be in, you know, he's has the advantage of senility, so he doesn't have to grapple with these tensions, but it is, you know, interesting to think about how someone of that age can really process um how accelerated things are and how crazy things are and how things change so rapidly and you see this with older folks you know left wing um you know civil rights era type boomers who are getting canceled because they aren't up to the you know up to the latest trend and in fact you have you know you know civil rights era left wing center left boomers who get canceled much more easily than someone who is extremely spicy and right wing but young and kind of has a better understanding of the taboos and terrains that one has to navigate um and so i i really do think it's 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 hard for the older generations it's a matter of just their the software that they have and the model of reality that was shaped into their minds at a time when we had a completely different country to really appreciate how crazy things are. And part of it is that they're just kind of have a more um, uh, constrained media diet. And part of it is just that, you know, their, their mind interprets things in, in such a way as to conform to that, the limitations of that software almost like a kind of um, uh, uh, a transcendental idealism of boomer myopia, <laughs> which is, you know, they, they bring these categories, to, they bring their own categories to bear on, you know, what they process and that, you know, creates a different understanding of events that then I think, you know, younger people have. And again, like I said, I think for younger people, it's, it's almost unimaginable that it would be any other way than you know extreme polarization. Yeah, yeah, that 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 definitely. Uh, I I can see how you know the polarization is going to continue, and you know the boomers are not not long for this world. So we're just. Uh, I'm curious what you think the the solution will be for this co continuously polarizing world. I, I know you you said before that you're not. Uh, you don't really want to put your trust in elections anymore, and I can understand why. Um, mm -hmm. But if if a voice is not on the table, then I guess exit is the only thing that remains. And then where where is the where shall we exit to, and and how how can that be done? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if I'd say I'm not putting trust in in elections. More that I'm not so sure that that's an optimal allocation of energy. In other words, I think, especially on the right, there is maybe a disproportionate concern for winning elections. And um, I think there's just a wide range of other things that are more, it's more important to get done, a kind of infrastructure, immediate infrastructure, like what I'm 
doing or trying to do with revolver.news, a media infrastructure, a kind of social infrastructure, maybe even a technological infrastructure um, that needs to be in place in order for it to matter when you win elections in the way that we think it matters. It, it's a, um, you know, the, the marginal benefit of winning an election is conditioned on that underlying infrastructure, which doesn't really exist, which is why the right, you know, comparatively, uh, you know, compared to other things, uh, they're actually good at winning elections. They're good at winning presidential elections. If you look at their record over the past, say, half century, but they've completely lost on things. And I think now more than ever, we're confronted with the undeniable um, uh, worthlessness of the GOP. And, you know, one answer to that would be, oh, well, this time we need to elect someone good. This time we need to look someone good then they disappoint you, they do nothing. And then you say, well, this time we're gonna primary them. How many iterations of this do you have to see before realizing that yes, all things equal, it's better to have better people in office and it does make some difference. But at the same time, it seems like the bottlenecks to actually getting real things done, real progress, the bottleneck to that isn't just that we haven't run the right person yet. Mm -hmm. You know, the bottlenecks are, uh, you know, deeper than that. They're in, you know, media, they're in tech, they're in um, just simple networking. And so that is to say that um, winning elect elections, the electoral process, I think is not unimportant, but to the extent that it is important, I think it's important almost more so for these kind of second order considerations. It's not like, oh, did you win or not? But it's who made friends with whom on the campaign, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what skills did one develop? How did the campaign rhetoric kind of uh, have an impact, however small, on the Overton window and the range of permissible discourse? You know, those types of things I think are more important even than oh, did this person get elected in order to act, enact this specific policy agenda? Um, so elections can be important, but I would say they're important for reasons other than actually winning the election. Um, but that uh, people, especially talented people, need to put their energies in you know, uh, inf other types of infrastructure that really need to be in place for elections to matter in the way that we think that they should matter. Yeah, I think the, the the bottleneck here is kind of what we were talking about before. You know about the the moral fervor and kind of where the, you know, kind of osmosis of the of the of essentially you know what 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 attracts people at the moment. What's the big magnet? And it feels like in a way you know um, the 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 GOP candidates are running uh, you know as, as Protestants candidate candidates for you know a seat a seat at the a Vatican you know they they're just not part of the the mainline religion and their mm -hmm. religion's not not popular within the Vatican because it is the Vatican and that's the religion and you're you know you, you just don't have a claim to to this throne mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm curious if maybe the lever for this would be at the level of the morality because you said okay you know the, the conservative need need to step up you need to become ballsy about their their own morality but to me it, it has felt that the only morality that we've seen from the conservatives is oh this is a bit too much you know oh we're, we've gone too far this year with this this is you know we, we need to get back to 1992 because that was the sweet spot the goldilocks zone that's not really a, a, a positive statement it's not really an affirmation of faith you know like i wouldn't necessarily go to a sermon uh, held by the guy who really wants to go back to 1992. And I understand why people are not flocking to this particular church, because it doesn't really make any positive statements. Um, is, there, is there anything outside of, you know, pure religion that, uh, that uh, th the conservatives could, could make as their platform, except for, oh, these people are crazy, so vote for us? Uh, I, I feel like there there should be something. Obviously, it's, it's hard to say what it is, but maybe you have an idea because I, I I'm not. It's not very clear to me what it could be. 
Yeah, I mean, I think even these people are crazy. Vote for us could work if they weren't, uh, you know, constrained by what they can actually identify as crazy. Like if if they weren't scared to actually say exactly what is crazy and why, and 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 to express that kind of moral conviction, a moral imperative to stop it, I think that would be very successful and it would be a great first step. So let's approach the issue with um, appropriately managed expectations. That would be an improvement for them to do that, but they're not even capable of doing that because really the, the right, the infrastructure of the right is not set up to win. It's not set up to play for keeps. It's set up just institutionally and culturally to play a kind of subordinate um, tag to be a subordinate player, junior partner in this tag team role of basically ensuring that the ruling class more broadly gets what it wants. And you can see this in the way that they toggle between justifications for a surrender. So you had um, some Ar you know, some guy from Arkansas of all places, you're going to think, okay, you guy, guy from Arkansas, there's going to be some issues there, but at least you can be confident that this person is going to be against, you know, sex changes for children. And so what have we come to when the guy from Arkansas isn't even against sex changes for children? It's ridiculous. And, and what is his excuse for this? Well, limited government. And so it's one of those things when, whenever they want to punt an issue or just not uh, just, I say, you know, just stand back while the other side screws the American people. They invoke limited government. And when they want to play an active role or enable government to screw the people, then they invoke national security. So when they want the government to do something to screw you, they say it's national security. When they want to sit back and allow the private sector to screw you, they say limited government. But either way, you get screwed, and you get screwed in exactly the way that the ruling class intends. And so they just toggle between these two positions. And just the way that within the party, they toggle between limited government and national security, the system at large toggles between the Republican and the Democrat. And of course, it always cashes out as, you know, what the, you know, ruling class of the globalist American empire wants. And so, and, and that's very hard. It's very hard to educate people about that because people are naturally very tribal and the tribal attachments that they seize upon or it's like i'm i'm the republican so when i see something embarrassing happen to a democrat you're gonna seize on that rather than look at a particular issue and say is this good for my issue but the people who are effective in american politics the you know the special interests look at it from an issue perspective rather than a kind of tribal affiliation perspective that will always end up kind of screwing people in terms of their interests. And that's, but that's very hard to get around when there's a 24 seven, just nonstop propaganda machine feeding false narratives into people's heads and manipulating them psychologically. Um, so I think, yeah, the short version is on the right, people are not playing for keeps. People are pay playing for scraps. They're not playing for keeps. They're playing for lobbying contracts. Fox News appearances and um, sinecures at a think tank. They're not playing for the full marbles. And so the stakes are low, you know, the stakes are low. And so there are just few people playing with, you know, with a sense of the highest stakes. And that's why the right is the pathetic mess that it is. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seems like um, they just feel great to be invited to this party that they shouldn't be at uh it's uh it's it's kind of you know a, a bit of an, an imposter situation um yeah i think there's um is, is there a way for them to be playing for keeps like just in the sense that like i said you know they're they're protestant imposters at the vatican um is there you know, when when you're surrounded by people that you feel don't share your morality, even if you have a, a maybe a stronger morality pointing the other way, um, 
could that also be a factor that you know everything just always careens left that you know it's essentially just a game theoretical situation where these you know you you feel outnumbered you feel like you know you can't defect on a system where you know everyone everyone's just pulling the other way and you you would just get wiped out it's kind of like you know in in stalinist russia everyone said oh you know if i'd be in government i'd be doing good things well if you'd be in government you'd be wiped out instantly by the people who are already in government who are there because they don't want to do good things it's because they want power so um i'm, I'm curious if they if they could be playing for keeps i mean just on an individual level like you know, if I decided, if I got into Congress, obviously I can't, I'm Romanian, but if, you know, hypothetically I did, um, how, how would one go about exerting power in, in, a, in a direction that, you know, is not necessarily left? Right. Well, again, I think the, the Congress example is more difficult because, as I was saying earlier, I do think there are pretty severe bottlenecks to what you can do. There's a ceiling to what you can do just as a member of Congress or as a politician at all, absent other maybe longer term and deeper kind of changes in, in the infrastructure and the culture and the networking and so forth. Um, and so I think, you know, playing for keeps is certainly an attitude and a perspective. It's maybe a, a more sophisticated sense of what, you know, the source of the problems. Um, I do think there's a kind of a generational issue. There's still so much cloud and so much political power is weighted in the older generations with their, you know, it has pluses and minuses, but the minuses are that the specific kind of political blind spots, I think, make it very difficult to play for keeps uh, in the sense that I'm talking about the, in a way that accurately reflects the condition that we're in. And so as long as kind of that older generation is effectively subsidizing all of the politics and the media on the right, I think it's going to be more difficult. I can see that changing as sort of younger people, maybe a class of, of uh, you know, Bitcoin millionaires and billionaires, maybe they could do something interesting. I'm not saying that they will, but I'm saying if something happens, it could come from that. But also, I think we have to kind of look at what is baked into the cake to condition what you know what it is that one is keeping one is, when one is playing for keeps like i think it requires a kind of honest evaluation of well is you know is does it make sense to call america a country in any sense or is it this kind of behemoth evil and corrupt empire in decline. And so people can form their own, you know, sub communities and sub polities and enclaves. And that could, that's, you know, that's the only way that one can seriously express politics and any politics that pretends to kind of revive life into the dead whale carcass is just fundamentally doomed and not and just not serious from the start like that's a real question i'm not saying one way or another but you know the playing for keeps requires an ambitious but still um a feasible objective uh and, and and so i think that's part of it too is kind of identifying you know just how much is baked into the cake and where you know where where's the real action is it in kind of building up enclaves, sub-communities? Is it um, a combination of that and taking more, uh, fuller advantage of multipolarity, which I've talked about in other contexts? Um, you know, it's, it's too early to tell, but these are the things that I think the next class of potential, you know, elites um, uh, will have to grapple with if they want to really be part of something um, uh, different and oppositional to what we see now. Yeah, I think um, the 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 rise of a counter elite is probably the the highest leverage thing that that can can move the needle because it is essentially the elite encapsulates the the worldview in a way and it kind of trickles down from there. And if there is if there is a counter elite, and I think there is, I mean at least parts of Silicon Valley are, are quite. Um, quite uh, based or <laughs> whatever, uh, maybe, maybe not publicly, but definitely uh, in, in the shadows, there's a lot of based activity going on. Um, but um, 
I think that's that's probably I would if I had to put my money on something that's going to move the needle. That's probably going to be it. And also the Bitcoin money that helps if, mm -hmm. if, if it actually continues. That'd be great. Um, right. um, I want to, to chat a little bit about your your dissertation as well. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah, because I, I, it, it strikes me as, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of been, been a while. I'll warn you. It's been a while, but. No worries. I'm definitely not going to go in, into depths. I mean, I've, I've, I haven't read it. <laughs> I haven't read the whole thing. I have read your thread on it. Um, oh, but good. yeah, so I'm, I'm very curious about it. I mean, it's, it sounds very intriguing because I've been kind of digging a little bit into Heidegger myself um, through Michael Millerman's work and kind of how he relates to Alexander Dugin's work as well. And there's just all sorts mm -hmm. of things going on in, in that type of scholarship. And I feel mm -hmm. like there's 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 quite an interesting lens that you know feeds into into a, a missing layer of political philosophy that we really you know the a deeper layer that uh, that people don't really have access to and I feel like you know people are talking about epiphenomena of things you know very very down the track but Heidegger's work kind of draws you back into um, you know, into into things that are really useful, like lenses, like, you know, what what is our self-conception, self you know, like, we talk about the individual a lot, you know, there's, there's other um, levels of abstraction that we could be looking at uh, that we don't, um, and that would be useful for, for political philosophy. But anyway, I'm, I'm really curious kind of what, what your perspective is. I know there's a, a mathematical component to this, which, you know, is definitely way over my head, but um, could you could you tell us a little bit, like, um, why is um, how how is how is this related to the structure of modernity? Like, what what is kind of the the essence of the of the paper, if that's possible? I'm sure it's, it's yeah. It's, I mean, I I can I can do my best on it. I'm always I always get um kind of self conscious because it's one of those things that I really do take seriously. I consider it more serious than you know any of the political stuff, and so I always want to be an effective representative because one of the things that triggers me is this common view that Heidegger is some kind of obscurantist. And this goes, this goes back a long ways. And part of the reason it triggers me because it's, it's, I don't blame people for having that um, assumption based on what the average encounter or discussion would be with someone who's a student or scholar of Heidegger. You know, there, there, it, there is a lot of sloppiness going on and there's a lot of sloppiness generally in what people call like the tradition of continental philosophy. It provides safe haven to um, sloppy kind of bullshit thinking in a way that maybe the more kind of Anglophone uh, uh, thinking and tradition doesn't. But I do think it's, it's one of those things that like in, in, in a fraction of a percentage of a time, um, you really have to appear obscuritans because you're presenting something genuinely original and important and profound. And I think that's the case with Heidegger. And it's just one of these dilemmas that you know, there, there's just a limited amount of time on, on the earth and even more limited time that one has at one's leisure to read things. And, um, you know, you just have to take it on faith that, okay, it'll be worth it. And then you have to have be this type of person who could actually get value out of it to put in those, uh, you know, years really of, of, of learning it. But then once you do, it really becomes kind of, uh, you know, it's in your it's in your bones. Even though I haven't looked at the dissertation in any kind of serious depth in in a long time, I haven't really done Heidegger seriously in a long time. It's still in my bones, irrespective of how well I'm even able to kind of articulate the idea. It's like it's 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 shaped my understanding of what the world is and what's conditioned our kind of. Uh, existence in it. Um, so with that kind of prefatory remark, uh, it's, it's, it isn't impossible to explain the kind of the contours of the, the thesis. And that is simply that um, I thought that, you know, there's, there's a whole literature out there, philosophical 
uh, debate about what modernity actually is. You know, when it, you know, when it emerges and, you know, it's, you can't talk about, oh, I think modernity begins here without saying this is what modernity is because to say it began here is to kind of privilege one characteristic over another. You know, just say modernity began with Machiavelli because of kind of an orientation toward a more positivist view versus a kind of, um, uh, you know, normative view, or it began with Hobbes for, you know, similar type of, of reason, or it, it began with Hobbes because he, you know, he's the real guy behind the positive political science sort of modeling people in this materialist fashion that, you know, we see kind of in, in some kind of further distorted form in academic political science, or that Hobbes is the first uh, 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 modernist because of his identification of the fear of violent death as a driving force behind politics. And, you know, so the fear behind people's crazy fear behind COVID is sort of Habesian in that fashion that, you know, no matter what, all, as long as you're getting rid of the fear of death and, you know, which translates, you know, to just a, a, a politics of creature comforts at, at the other extreme, that that's um, what modernity is all about. And, you know, or is modernity uh, characterized by a clean break with the religious tradition of the scholastics and, and the medievalists, or is modernity some kind of weird transmogrification, some different expression of developments in theology. That's what my thesis advisor thinks. And he wrote a book on it called Theological Origins of Modernity and how like, um, and there are others who write about how like the emergence of nominalism kind of facilitated the various types of um, heuristic scientific thought experiments, for instance, by Newton. And that's, you know, so, so there's all these kinds of theories of what modernity actually is. And so what my thesis does basically is it presents a thesis of what modernity is. And it says that modernity is fundamentally mathematical, but it marshals a conception of mathematics that comes from Heidegger in order to say it's mathematical, but in this Heideggerian sense, which is a more robust sense than we commonly or you know, in colloquial terms think of what, it, what math is. And so that's the first part of it. The second part is I say, well, the two components that I identify as fundamental or essential to modernity that really come into place through the collective efforts of um, Newton, Galileo, and Descartes are um, uh, self, uh, self-grounding, self-grounding, self-reference, on the one hand, and the other characteristic is homogeneity. Self-grounding and homogeneity. And those are very general characteristics. And I trace their development through to different philosophers leading all the way up to uh, this latest stage of what Heidegger calls like the you know, technological uh, modernity, technological nihilism. But just I think when people hear that, they're automatically saying, okay, where the hell did he just go with that? But just to make it a little more concrete, what, what, do you, what can one mean by self-grounding, self-reference? Well, it's quite simple. The um, Cartesian paradigm, and again, this is a great simplification, but the simplification in Descartes is grounding all of epistemology in the Cartesian subject. So um, everything is grounded in the self-conscious cognition of the subject, and therefore everything is grounded in the subject, but the subject is grounded in itself because it's self-referential as kind of grounded in its own self-consciousness. 
That's the kind of cogito. It's it it's not. There's nothing underneath that. It's that oh, you you can ground epistemology in the Cartesian subject because the Cartesian subject is aware of itself as that one point of certitude, and that's the basis of certitude upon which to build all uh, epistemology. So it's grounded in itself. And another way to say that it's grounded in itself is that it draws upon itself everything it requires for its own self-grounding. In other words, it draws upon what it already has in advance. Now, it seems like I just, why, are you, why did you just use this bizarre formulation? Oh, you're drawing upon what you already have in advance. Well, there's a reason for that. In advance. Why, what is the relationship between in advance and mathematics? Well, now this gets to the conception of math that Heidegger uh, identifies in the Greeks. And people who have read a little bit about the Greeks who know this is that um, ta mathemata and mathematics in, in, in Greek, basically the, in the various cognates refer to that which is taught and that which is learned. That's what it means. And so what does that have to do with the in advance? Well, the Greeks also had this idea that what is taught or what is learned is already with us in advance. Learning is recollection. And the most clear and explicit um, evidence of this comes from our clear understanding of mathematical concepts. And so if you look at, for instance, um, Platonic dialogues like the Mino, which is a very rich and complicated dialogue, Socrates illustrates this idea of learning as recollection through a mathematical demonstration that again may or may not be ironic, but that's a different point. He does it through this mathematical demonstration saying that math is the clearest example to us that when we're learning something, it's not something exogenous that's just sort of coming in here. It's something already here that we're drawing out or becoming more clear with. So we're drawing upon what we already have in advance. And so that gets to my observation about the Kajito, is that Kajito grounds knowledge in what we already have in advance. And therefore, in that structural sense, it, it, it is mathematical in, 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 that, in that deepest sense. And so the self-grounding of the Cartesian subject, that experiences a very interesting um, development in intellectual history or in philosophical history. The self-grounding of the Cartesian subject, for instance, has a different expression, um, for instance, in Kant, right? In, in, in Kant, it's all about drawing upon what one already has in itself. The, you know, first of all, the, the kind of uh, the, the categories, the properties of mind, but you know the special role that he ascribes to mathematics is that basically the ma the mathematics is already built into our special form of of cognition, and also you know the the Kantian morality is sort of self referential and self grounding, and that's you know the the um, you know, one of the form, one of the expressions of the categorical imperative is like, it's what does it mean to be a morally autonomous individual is you obey your own law. And that's built into the structure of what morality is for Kant. So again, it's that self-reference and self-grounding. So it's the epistemology of Descartes. You keep the self-grounding and self-reference, but you transfer it into this kind of moral framework of Kant. And then the self-grounding, self-reference expresses itself in different and maybe more political terms in Rousseau. Mm -hmm. And again, I could get into that, but I think I've gone on a lot. And then it takes a different but same structural formulation in Nietzsche. And people like with the Nietzsche in the eternal recurrence 
the the way that you overcome nihilism to Nietzsche in one fashion is to basically will everything that's ever happened. And so the collective will is willing everything that's already happened. And so what for what starts as the uh, Cartesian subject and moves into the Kantian moral category in, in Rousseau as a political form, in, in Nietzsche it becomes this will that wills itself, you know, throughout all of eternity as the kind of uh, redemptive um, uh, eternal recurrence. And so, you know, Heidegger has an excellent um, lecture series on Nietzsche in which he grapples with Nietzsche and the mathematical structure that I kind of, the mathematical structure kind of comes from me, but I think it, it's, it's everywhere in Heidegger's um, uh, dealing with, in German, they would call it the Aus Einandersetzung, which is a nice long German word. And then in Heidegger, I say that that mathematical structure of the self-grounding, self-reference achieves its final expression in uh, Heidegger's characterization of technology. So, so if that seemed kind of complicated or long or interesting, that's just one component. I, and I also mentioned there's another component, which is homogeneity. And um, I'll leave that, <laughs> if anyone's interested, they can go into my actual dissertation and see how homogeneity works. But the really interesting thing is, it's not just that I just uh, identify these two things as separate. There is ultimately these two things develop concurrently, but then merge together in this final technological form. They merge together. And I also, characterize the developmental logic of these two features itself in mathematical terms. So the kind of historical dialectic by which these two separate mathematical structures or properties develop, that historical development is itself governed by mathematical properties in that original sense. So it's, you know, it's really, um, it's one of those things, like, I, I can't believe I did it. I don't think I could do it again, but I'm, I, I, uh, I'm very pleased with it. <laughs> and uh, it's, I, it's uh, and, you know, when I get a breather from the uh, political stuff, you know, I've been putting it on the back burner, but I absolutely need to, you know, publish it and maybe kind of do some follow-ups. Um, you know, now I've become somewhat of a, a controversial figure, but, um, you know, back when I was doing this, I mean, really the, the best Heidegger scholars in the world all said it is one of the best things that they've read about Heidegger ever, or even about, um, you know, uh, modernity and these things. So, um, so that's kind of in a nutshell, what's, what's going on with that. Yeah, do do you um trace back kind of the in in a way, you know, the, the, the neoliberal subject is this self making self, you know, self referential by by design. What could that you know, is that essentially your your diagnosis for the root of this? Obviously we haven't gone into the homogeneity area, but it does strike me that, you know, you know, we we are self referential by in, in the most profound way. And is, is that the characteristic of modernity? Um, I mean, again, that is one characteristic and I like it, at least in the dissertation, I try to approach it on what I think is the, the deepest level, but it, it, it has different expressions and I cert I don't think it's entirely unrelated this kind of, um, you know, and this, this has been done to death. Uh, again, like this, this is something that the derivatives of Heidegger or the people just kind of picking up the pieces can do. And I'm sure that there are, you know, thousands of articles on, you know, Heidegger and the selfie, or if not Heidegger and the selfie, then on um, subjectivity. And so, because basically the whole, you know, for, for, for Heidegger, the whole uh, issue with Descartes, that was subjectivity and subjectivity culminated in uh, Nietzsche, in Heidegger's interpretation of Nietzsche. And so basically another way to kind of formulate my thesis, I simply say that, okay, 
well, but subjectivity itself is conditioned by the mathematical and you can understand subjectivity in mathematical terms. That's another way to say it. But absolutely, I think the kind of this self, this self reference um, is, uh, is definitely part of it. But, um, but yeah, one has to be careful uh, with these categories so as not to just, you know, at a certain point it can become like literary observations but um, but yeah, the short answer is yes. I think that it's no accident. And despite this certainty that I have that people have written about Heidegger and the selfie, I don't think that's even an invalid kind of observation. Um, it's, um, um, yeah, it's just um, the condition that we're in. And, and I do think that in order to understand it on the deepest level, you know, really Heidegger is the last word on the issue. I would say <coughs> Heidegger's um, confrontation with Nietzsche. And that's really the last philosophical treatment of it. But we may be in a kind of post-philosophical stage of existence. You know, that's, you know, there's a lot of interesting things that Heidegger talks about is like, Dasein is not coterminous with the human being. You know, uh, Dasein is a specific way of being that is available in certain contexts to human beings, but there can be human beings without Dasein. And there certainly can be human beings without philosophy. And, you know, you can think of that on deep philosophical terms, or you can simply think of it as like, what is the precondition for philosophy to flourish? Think about Heidegger's time. Think about the quality of his students, the people who are not on his stature, but the people who are simply on the level to appreciate what he was in order to carry on that tradition or to kind of tweak it in their own sense. Like he had his students, you know, some, I'm not the biggest fan of Hannah Arendt, but if Hannah Arendt was around now, she would certainly be, you know, one of the great public intellectuals, the, uh, you know, people like Hans Jonas, um, even Gadamer, you know, again, it's not that I'm a huge fan, but compared to what we have now, Leo Strauss is another one. You know, all of these people, these were students who were self-professedly inferior to Heidegger, and yet now any one of them would be, you know, light years ahead of, of what we have now. I mean, it, you can't even mention these types that we have now in the same, you know, it's just it's a complete joke. And so the point is not to denigrate what we have now, which, you know, but the point is to say that for something like Heidegger, Heidegger couldn't exist today because there's not, there's no ecology in place to cultivate that sort of talent and insight or even to appreciate it and you don't have a critical mass of people who are um, educated like you know his students were, who could appreciate and sustain a force like that. So Heidegger as a human type, I think it more or less has become impossible. I don't wanna say that definitively, but I think it's very, you know, it, it, it's, it's pretty close to that, that Heidegger as a human type is impossible. The philosopher as a human type is impossible. And it's just as maybe just as ridiculous to think of a philosopher existing now. And it is to think of a hoplite existing now. It's like you can't have someone as a hoplite. You can have someone who, if they were born, you know, if they were in Sparta, they would have been a great hoplite. Just like now you could have someone who in another context might have been a great philosopher, but it requires the right soil and the right ecology for it to flourish into its full form and express itself. And I don't, just don't think it were there. We're barely, forget about post 
philosophical society. We're basically a post-literate society. And so that's just the thing. And, um, and, and again, you have like, it, it's one of these things where you, you have just absolute trash and you have, you know, this, the, the politicized mess um, on one hand, you have this politicized mess. Um, and so comparatively, the kind of the tech philosophers seem better but again it's like the tech philosophers you know again there's this this extreme um there's just no real philosophical spirit in it and it's attractive just because in most cases it's better than the alternative which is even worse but there's really no philosophical spirit that exists it's an age of really uh, unchecked Philistinism. And um, because of that, and because everything's so fractured and deracinated, and there's really no possibility per, for prestige even, because prestige requires similar types of precondition. So really the only thing that, that matters like now more than anything else for various reasons is simply having money because that's at least agreed upon like value thing It's like you know if you think of you know prestige and status and other forms that are independent of of money it's like those are much more tenuous now because there's no underlying coherence to sustain some idea of real prestige or getting an a, an award that actually means something as honorific and so now it really is this age of you know the mega the mega billionaires, because that's really the only kind of form that can genuinely express itself and exert itself in, in this ecology that we have. You know, it's not an age of philosophers. And what, what do you trace about? What was the, the moment where, you know, who was the last philosopher? Was it, was it Heidegger and, and what kind of led yeah, to- I think to it was Heidegger. I, I think it was Heidegger for sure. Was he it was modernity that killed him while he was diagnosing it? Um, I don't know. It was, it was, you know, he was, he diagnosed, you know, he was the break from modernity. He was really in the, in the precise sense, the postmodernist, if you take him at his own word that Nietzsche completed subjectivism. Um, but yeah, it, I just, it, you know, you could look at it in terms of the internal evolution of, of philosophy, which is that, you know, that's the framework that Heidegger used, or you can simply look at it in extraneous terms, like I even say, like, leaving open the possibility, like in theory, I guess, for philosophy to develop the, you know, the preconditions for it don't seem to be there. And again, I'm I'm reluctant to say that definitively, but it seems like we're pretty close to that. And so, again, maybe, you know, one of Heidegger's great uh, lines, great infamous lines is, um, wo aber Gefahr ist, wächst das Redende auch. Um, I think I said that right. And it's um, where the danger is, that's where the saving element is as well. And so this idea that when just uh, when it looks so bleak, then, you know, that bleakness can generate its own form of greatness or allows for, you know, it's a kind of greatness that even non-bleak times could, you know, uh, couldn't produce. So that's always a possibility. Um, but, um, but it's hard to fully trust the plan in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think this is this is sufficiently white pilled um, for 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 us to wrap up on. I thank you for for going down down the deep end with me. Um, I think this is super fascinating. I'm, I'm definitely not at you know any any close level of scholarship, but I find you know this whole field super interesting. Um, I want to ask you the last question. It's a question of the show, which I ask everyone. Um, do you have a thinker, um, maybe, maybe not Heidegger, but someone, someone who you think is, uh, is, is a useful, offers a useful frame, offers insights that people might not be aware of, that people might want to check out, maybe someone who's, you know, subversive, but not that well known, um, someone mm -hmm. who's influenced you, dead or alive? Well, 
<laughs> my Twitter, of course, if anyone hasn't been to my Twitter, <laughs> at Darren J. Beattie. But um, yeah, um, hmm. subversive. I mean, for political commentators, just simply by virtue of the the concept of um, anarcho tyranny and how powerful and important that is, I would have to say uh, Sam Francis for for that concept that I still think is supremely relevant for understanding the, you know our our regime type. So that's the on the political commentator level, I would say Sam Francis. Yeah, I've seen I've seen a few a few more edgy bloggers pick up the concept nowadays. So I think mm -hmm. it's, it's it's gaining steam again. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's good to good to draw it back to San Francisco. A lot of people like to coin their own stuff. And uh, El Narco Tyranny comes from San Francisco, guys, <laughs> just just so you know. <laughs> um, yeah. well, thank you so much, Darren. Um, where can people find uh, your stuff? Uh, we said Twitter, but is there any other place where, where people can read you or, or find you? Yep. At, at Darren J. Beattie on Twitter. And if you're not checking it out, go to revolver.news. Go there every day and... Um, you know, feel free to subscribe if you want an ad-free version, but revolver.news is my uh, uh, endeavor. It's a very successful media enterprise. It's shaped narratives on the national level, and um, we have a great investigative team, and we're building it out even more so, so a lot more to come. So other than my Twitter, um, go to revolver.news, check out the news of the day, cutting edge investigation and great uh, opinion pieces as well. Yes, thank you so much for that. And also check out the dissertation, which you can find on the internet, um, which downloads. That too, that too. <laughs> Almost 10,000 downloads, which by, you know, dissertation standards is a New York Times bestseller. Yeah, well, you're a controversial guy. People want to want to check out what. what right, they're doing. they're looking, they're they're uh, scrolling through the pay, uh, the the dissertation for the N word or something. Yeah, like Control that. F Nazi. That's probably right. the main function for it. Uh, right. Well, thank you so much, Darren. It was it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.